I think there's a lot of alarmism about hey AI is going to wipe out the human race and it's a genuine smile because my thought is why are we placing the human species on a pedestal if it wipes us out or drive wipes us out but just for the sake of the listeners like the classic example of this is something called the paperclip maximizer right that's a thought experiment used for this that if you build an all powerful machine whose purpose is to maximize manufacturing paperclips and it goes haywire then it could start turning all organic matter into material for paperclips till the whole universe is paperclips and what do you do AI can go out or back like that yeah. so i i find the claims that the ai will rule the world the machines will dominate i find them to be farcical that's not a fair description it's science fiction material Welcome to Everything is Everything. This is episode two of our show, and in episode one, when we told you guys about the name Everything is Everything, I, uh, you know, uh, uh, questions came in: Why this show name? What does it mean? So I want to talk about this a bit because you know, Ajay, the song means a lot to both of us. A song called "You're Missing" by Bruce Springsteen from the album The Rising, and it came out after nine uh, eleven. And one, it's a deeply moving song; never fails to really hit me hard. And also, it's a masterpiece in craft. And why I consider Springsteen so highly in terms of songwriting, like um, I give it as an example to my writing students of how when you want to uh, invoke deep emotion, you don't need fancy adjectives or wordplay or whatever. Just a simple uh, recounting of what is there and using simple terms can do it. And the song you're missing is really about. somebody who's in an apartment and their loved one has, has uh, died because of 911 and just the lyrics of the song like i want to read some out shirts in the closet shoes in the hall mama's in the kitchen baby and all coffee cups on the counter jackets in the chair papers in the doorstep but you're not there everything is everything everything is everything but you're missing and just a simple words blows me away and how much you can do with those words or seemingly banal everything is everything you know is just so mind blowing and it moves me deeply but that's not the reason we uh, that's not the only reason we chose that because how many people would uh, you know have heard the springsteen song but for me the re- the reason the title everything is everything works is that both of us are people who don't want to look at the world through one frame we want to we are interested in many different subjects and we want to look at them through many different frames and we want to emphasize the interconnectedness of everything that we contain multitudes the world contains multitudes and every piece of us is joined to every piece of everything else your thoughts um so precisely i think that so much of the world is organized around the incentives to specialize there's too much knowledge in the world and the incentive arrangements of the world are organized so that you become a specialist you tend to become narrow you tend to know less but really to understand and grapple with the complexities of the world and to think about how to act in it is all about interdisciplinary thinking where we bring together diverse tools and pieces of the puzzle in figuring out the world so that's that sense of everything is everything everything is interconnected um i also like a different part of the color and the mood of the phrase everything is everything as you read from the lyrics there's a certain calm there's a certain quiet we're not screaming we're not raging the world is here everything is everything and we calmly dispassionately look at it and be curiously engage at it in a soft thoughtful way so for me it also says something about not a rage rage against the passing of the night but a quiet comfortable confident view of that everything and does that fit into who you are today or were you always like this was there a journey to get to this point where you can have that uh, thera this oh, absolutely so i wasn't here for a long time but Uh, i think it's an essential part of all of us that we have to be marathon runners the world is hard the world is complicated and there is no point in screaming it doesn't help it's important to uh, have that psychic dynamite but played out in a sustained way and you spoke of dynamite uh, our main subject for the day and today we are really going to talk about just one thing and our main subject for the day is kind of dynamite in the world today because it's filled the future with so many unknown unknowns and that's of course artificial intelligence 
So yeah, while you saw the title on the screen, my producer just said that hey, you're having too much of the resting pout face, so you got a smile. So I'm going to give a jokerish permanent smile on my face right now. So thank you, Maybe producers. Maybe a joker mask will work. Maybe a joker mask will work. Yeah, <laughs> sense. But let's sort of talk about AI. And one of the points that you often make, and both of us have different things to say about it, and we'll go through them. But one of the points that you often make, which I'd like you to elaborate upon, is that firstly, it shouldn't even be called AI. Yeah, so unhappy at the mass portrayal of AI. Hiding in the phrase AI is the idea that this is something like the fluid, general intelligence, creativity, and passion of a human being. And if somebody said that we had a machine that was getting to something like this, oh boy, would I be interested? And that would be, you know, really a big transformation of the world. But that's not remotely where we are. Everything that passes for AI in this world are really statistical models that are processing data. And, you know, I love statistics. I love data analysis. That's what I've done for a living my entire life. And it's a great tool, but it is a highly limited tool. So I feel that we need to constantly remind everybody about the limitations of what is out there. Statistical models are incredibly powerful and interesting and exciting. But we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that this is the fluidity, consciousness, creativity, purpose of a human being. There are deep mysteries about human beings that in the world of statistical models and computer science, we only dimly perceive and we're not even remotely there. So yes, you could train a program to study x-rays and flag the x-rays that have signs of TB. Okay, And great. Is that useful? Yes. Is that, you know, fluid general intelligence? Of course not. I mean, it would be a farce to even suggest that. So I just want to say that a great deal of the conventional discourse is overblown and we need to think carefully about what these tools are. So I want to both agree and disagree. And I'll agree in the sense that uh, what, what I... Uh, you, you know, it's commonly said about AI that we'll call something AI till it becomes commonplace and part of our lives and then we just treat it as commonplace, as normalized. We don't call it AI anymore. It doesn't seem magical, whether it is computers or the internet or whether it is like GPS. You know, one of my friends recently remarked that uh, young people are never going to know what it is like to get lost, yeah. you know, which our generation did. And GPS kind of solves that. So things get normalized. We take it for granted. We move on. So in that sense, I kind of agree with you. Where I disagree with you is that, you know, when we talk about human intelligence, um, a lot of people who are kind of um, uh, rubbishing AI today, like the, the, the first point I want to make is that, to rubbish AI at this early stage of AI, and I feel in the long arc of things it is of course early, is like rubbishing computing in 1950 when you saw a 2 MB mainframe that fit a room and saying, oh, normal people will never use this, but it is too early to do that. But as much as that, the tendency that I see among a lot of people is this hubris of thinking that human intelligence is somehow, uh, you know, something special and mystical and computers can never reach that. But I just want to put to you that you and I are able to have this conversation after being trained on LLMs that are a fraction of the size of the modern LLMs that are being used. And we have a fraction of the processing power that all of these computers do. So it seems to be an absolute no-brainer that everything that we do, they'll be able to do better. So, now, you might argue that, hey, you know, what about creativity? What about that artistic urge? And we, of course, are artists, as we discussed in the last episode. I was an allegation made on us. But here's the thing. We ascribe a mysticality to that act of creation only because we don't understand it. Right. We don't understand exactly how our neurons are firing and what they're drawing upon to create what we are creating. And therefore, it seems almost a mystical process to it. And in fact, one of the themes that I've spoken about in many episodes of The Seen and the Unseen is about art and craft. People will make a difference between art and craft and craft will be almost like a mechanistic doing of something again and again, whereas art is something mystical. But the truth is they are the same thing. The only difference is that in art, we don't know the mechanisms and therefore it seems mystical to us. But what I am saying is it displays how little we know about our brains, but it doesn't mean that there is something that we are doing that is beyond the reach of AI. I, I think it is a no-brainer that eventually everything that uh, we do uh, can be done by uh, uh, AI and I, I, I'm an optimist in that sense. 
So let's narrow our focus to the current hot kid on the block, the large language models, and to fix intuition because there are actually many other things going on in the field. And I would like to talk about some stuff that has me incredibly impressed and excited. But for right now, let's stick to the LLMs. You will say that the LLM is a mere word prediction engine. So it would take a sentence like the show that Amit Verma and Ajay Shah created is likely to be called X and it will guess by looking at a whole bunch of the corpus of my writings and your writings that we are nutcases and we'll come up with the phrase everything is everything. Okay, that would be the pinnacle of what this kind of word prediction could go to. Now, you're saying that the creativity bit is something that we don't understand and I'm perfectly comfortable with that. I'm not after the word mystical. Uh, I mean, to use old terminology of idealism and materialism, I'm on the materialism side. There is nothing happening in the skull other than some quantum mechanics of how the atoms in this brain work. But no LLM in this universe is going to have that bubbling, burning interest, curiosity, urge to say that you and I will get together and build a show on YouTube and we will have this amazing production arrangement and it will be called Everything is Everything. I mean, all the acts of creation that led up to this are beyond what any LLM can think. So LLMs are good word prediction engines. The world has a use for good word prediction engines, but they're no more than word prediction engines. And I just get scared of the word intelligence being applied to that. Intelligence is a big word. So you, you want to dumb down the phrase intelligence? Very well, give us a different phrase. So now some people like to use the phrase artificial general intelligence. Saying, no, no, no. Like Ken Thompson's algorithm for using dynamic programming to solve end games in chess is actually not AI. It's a mere algorithm that solves end games in chess well. So that's what you alluded to, that these things got normalized. When we first put dynamic programming to solve end games in chess, it was like a thunderbolt going off. Like, wow, this thing can figure out how to do end games. Today, it's boring. We all just take it for granted that, yeah, when you get to the end game, you use this dynamic programming algorithm. It's eerie. It like looks 20 deep without needing 20 ply. It's not AI. So if all these cool, interesting programs are going to be called intelligence, very well, then I don't want to call the essence of human beings intelligence. Let's coin a new phrase. Let's call it artificial general intelligence. So I'm just on the point that nice, clever algorithms, nice, clever word prediction is useful, is interesting, is not intelligence. Right. So sort of, I'd like to make three points on that basis and I'll try and do it with a smile. <laughs> because, but there are the three points. One is that a common criticism against LLM is that, hey, these are autocorrect on steroids, okay. right? Of course they are. Yeah. So are we. Martin Amis, uh, who died recently, um, rest in peace, wrote this great book called The War on Cliché, which is a book of his criticism. You know, any artist, any writer will tell you that what worries them the most is cliché. That's what they want to avoid. Yeah. And I remember in a, re a wonderful recent episode Gaurav Chintamani uh, did with me on The Seen and the Unseen, he said at one point, and he's a immensely talented musician, produces many talented musicians. And he said, Ki kya yaar, originality kya hi hai? In the sense that, you know, it's an overused term and perhaps there is nothing like it, right? And uh, and I think that is something that we need to consider that a lot of the time when we have the conversations that we are having, we are also doing autocorrect on steroids. Are those standard phrases mind mein aa jate You know, aap cover drive dekho, you watch a cover drive on TV and immediately the way to describe it will be elegant cover drive because elegant has become the cliche or adjective you're always going to use for cover drive. You see someone bowling accurately, you'll say metronomic accuracy autocomplete on steroids right there. That becomes an issue. So I would say that here again, hubris, we might be overestimating ourselves. My second of three points is that, yes, in the act of creation, it is unlikely that it is by itself autonomously going to come up with, oh, Ajay Shah and Amit Verma are going to do a show called Everything is Everything and Vartika and Rakshita will produce it, right? But by itself, it won't come up with that. But you could set it the task that, okay, Ajay Shah and Amit Verma are two interesting people who had these conversations here 
here are these conversations here is everything they have ever written they are going to do do a show together what would you call it what would it be about and it'll give you 10 20 30 different options and obviously it would perhaps not know enough about our private lives to know that you're going to talk about seagulls and all that but it can go a long long way like i had uh, the great writer jerry pinto on in an eight hour episode on the scene and the unseen and perhaps my most memorable oral history and he's written this beautiful crime thriller called murder in mahim and i said are you writing any more and he said no and the prediction i made that he kind of i think agreed with he's read a few years from now i don't want to set a time to it but a few years from now you'll be able to tell an ai write me nine more books in that series and it will and they'll be so good that jerry will go wow and he won't know the difference right uh, you know that whole thing about monkeys writing shakespeare if you have enough monkeys you know ai is going to write create work of that quality because like even with music for example why do we react to music and this is something formulaic mainstream music has started figuring out where they have so many formulas on how you create a pop song but you have certain combinations of notes hitting certain neurons in your brain making you feel a certain way melancholic or blah blah or whatever you give an llm enough music you give it enough responses to that music it'll eventually start creating work that is as good and i would not call them non-creative just because an organic flesh and blood creature that is destined to die did not create it but instead um, a, a software did with its collection of algorithms and finally i completely agree with you and i after you finish responding to these i'd really love to hear your elaborations of why llms are a very limited part of ai and there is so much exciting work happening in llms that goes like in ai that goes way beyond this yeah. so let me just respond to this and some thoughts on llms and we should talk about other in my opinion more exciting things so uh is it a is it a word correction word correction on steroids? Yes, of course. I want to take a stand for the human race on two things. One is, as you acknowledged, it's never going to come up with the idea that let's do X. There is something bubbling inside our flesh and blood. I don't want to use any mystical terms, but we are unique. That modern science is nowhere near understanding the energies and the drive of the human being, which creates purpose, which makes us wake up in the morning and say, hey, let me try X. Only we do that and no LLM will ever do that. Next, I will take a stand and defend human beings in the following fashion. Let's imagine you're standing in 1905 and you have every text in the world in front of you. Okay, no LLM word correction under any prompting scheme will come up with Einstein's special theory of relativity. That is a thunderbolt moment where something new is created for the first point. And I'm just making an elementary statistical observation that if your corpus never had special relativity, no LLM will ever invent special relativity. Okay, similarly on the music, in our previous episode, we talked about something about what happened in the world of music in the 70s, which was something special and unique. And there's a whole bunch of derivative stuff that has happened in the later period. And yes, indeed, in some sense, you and I are not excited about that. And the LLMs will manufacture that. But the LLMs will not invent something new because by their very definition. So just I'm a programmer that works with these things. And there is a fundamental limitation that I study lots of data sets. I mimic that. I'll never invent a Taj Mahal. If I'm standing at Akbar's tomb in Sikandra, that's the state of the art. That's my past. I'll never come up with the next steps of the great arms race of monuments in Delhi. So it will forever be derivative. We will keep on wrapping versions of what has already been known. So prompt engineering is good. So there are uses for this. Okay. So I my my the my concept of the use case, I'm saying hardly, I'm hardly saying anything original here. My concept of the use case is we write in terse bad language, the essence of an idea in a paragraph, and we tell this bloke that give me a 2,000 word formal florid business memo, okay? Or a 1,000 word op-ed. And he'll give you a first draft of that. And you got to be very careful to never ever send it off because it will be riddled with mistakes. As the euphemistic phrase goes, the LLMs are known to hallucinate, which is invent completely imaginary facts. So they can't be treated as the last draft. It can save time for some people to go from a, from a one para to a thousand word op-ed draft and then you take that and you edit it and you kick it into shape. And that can have its value, but it's no more than that. It's never going to build new things. And, you know, I, for me, the core 
of the excitement of the passion of life is to something new. The rest is all derivative. You just keep on churning out products. We discussed uh, on an email an LLM that makes podcasts and you'll get the point. That will never make the scene and the unseen. I mean, any ep your episode with Jerry Pinto is something unique. It's a creative product. It's a product of that moment. You have many, many times been in an amazing moment with that human being and something happened there and there were words and emotions that were created in that moment that an LLM transcript writer would not have got. Even though, like, you know the complete corpus of what Jerry Pinto has written and you know the complete corpus of what Amit Verma has ever said. I challenge that statistical prediction model to create the transcript of your Jerry Pinto conversation. I agree with you as far as LLMs are concerned, perhaps, that right? you're not going to get Einstein series or relativity from yes. it. But I think you, uh, one, I think that it's not a binary that you need to necessarily Thank compare you. it to humans enough. It's it's an incredible tool in many ways that I've seen myself. And two, I believe that AI will be able to come up with Einsteinish discoveries. So we'll come to that in a moment. We'll but I just want us to be careful about the LLM game. These things are useful. They have their place. They are not intelligent. They're tools. They're useful tools. Okay. So I want to say two things about what I think is going on by way of these useful tools. The first is it's a tool for a master. That is the product has to always be approved by a master. The product can never be approved by a junior. So I have done lots of experiments generating text, generating code. It would be absolutely dangerous to treat that as a final product. You have to be a very good expert to look for the text, to look at the text, to look at the code and verify for yourself that this works well. And it can occasionally work well, but it is wrong so often that you could never treat it as a final product. So it occasionally there are some problem statements where it's amazing, where you write down the prompt engineering and you get a complete working code. You get a lovely, well-structured four paragraphs, but that's rare and we can imagine why because there's so much rubbish on the internet you've trained the model on a bunch of garbage called the content of the internet i mean imagine wikipedia is used on a large scale by these things sub reddits are used on a large scale in these things there's a lot of nonsense and trash there and you know you and i would never uncritically accept the corpus that is the internet now this is just using that so they'll be limited uh, there is some research which is teaching us some interesting propositions so imagine we sort the labor market into quartile one, two, three, four. One are the weakest, two are better, three are strong, and four are the masters. My mental model, and this is borne out by some of the research, is that the LLMs are useful for converting class two people, Q2 people, into approximations of Q3, not Q4, but you're getting a huge jump. I think this is absolutely fantastic for India. This is a tool made for India, where we are short of masters. So there's very little high-end talent. Okay, The Indian uh, top-end capability is vanishingly small. There are very large numbers of weak people. This is a tool made in heaven for the Indian production environment. We'll need to find management techniques to layer around it. But you take a Q2 person, support them with an LLM, and they'll do Q3 work. And then you'll need a master to check the work, approve the work, and this is great. So this is an enormous productivity tool. This is a tool tailor-made for India. Like the good Lord could not have designed something more effective for our country. And I'm thrilled as India. I'm just objecting to the hype. I'm just saying, let's be thoughtful and understand the limitations of this. This is useful. It's a good tool and it has limitations. Similarly, you know, using GitHub Copilot is good and useful in the hands of a master. I'm almost afraid of what it will do to early stage people because the lines of code that are being suggested as you are typing, in a way, are killing the problem-solving of the mind. So I see it as contaminating the journey to mastery. Okay, We all start out as journeymen and we get stronger. So I feel that people fixing up text manufactured by ChatGPT may permanently lose the craft of writing. So, you know, are we, are, is it the case that you and I are old fogies and... We think it's important to have the power to take an idea and turn it into a thousand word text or a 10,000 word text. Or is this a calculator where you do 731 multiplied by 137 and it does it and you don't need to actually ever know how to multiply? I lean towards the former that the LLMs are a pathway to get to the point of getting a first draft. 
of that thousand word or ten thousand word text. But then you actually need the mastery of turning it into the final product. And I don't know how to overcome that journey to mastery for people who have actually not practiced the craft of programming, of writing. So, you know, I both agree with you entirely and I'll elaborate on that, but I also don't exactly share your fears or your worries in certain regards. For example, I think that, you know, you're bemoaning that will there be people who will, uh, if they are getting automatic code done for them or automatic copy done for them, will they go through the rigorous process that you take to become a master? And my sense is, look, man, in every generation, there's a very small layer of people who have the motivation and the desire to become masters or to become higher order thinkers, as it were. And that proportion is very low to begin with. They are self-motivated and they're going to get there anyway, right? And the reason they're going to get there anyway is the incentive to be a master or a higher order thinker is, I think, is going to be orders of magnitude bigger than in the past because now you have incredibly powerful tools to, you know, manifest your higher order thinking and to uh, do things with your mastery. The tools you have are absolutely incredible. So I, I, I think it's always a small percentage of people and the incentives are better now, uh, number one. And number two, as far, you know, the the, the, the classic worry about uh, you know, what's like, first, I do think it's going to be good for India for a certain bunch of people. Now, the fear that a lot of people express is what about the others? What about the court coolies? You know, once GPT goes another level, maybe GPT-5 or whatever. Like, I often say that copywriting and illustrator jobs are going to vanish because if you're in a copy house, you don't need a creative, creative director with 10 copywriters. You need a creative director who can prompt. And I'm very serious about this. This is going to happen today. It's going to happen in Illustrator, for Illustrators. At some point, you've played with code. I don't know how much, but at some point, it's going to happen with code as well if, if it isn't likely right now. I'm not totally worried about that because what I think is that the productivity gains will be so incredibly high mm-hmm. that it'll just go back into the economy and, uh, you know, there'll be, uh, it, it, it's not going to be a long-term employment problem as such beyond the fact that we already have a long-term employment problem because of yeah. the- no, I'm, I'm comfortable with all that I I have no concerns and uh, difficulty about job loss and all that uh, the market economy of the last 1000 years has absorbed many an upheaval the steam engine electricity and so on this is small change compared to that so this will get sorted I'm just after some of the overblown claims around the words intelligence and I do worry so let me take Writing as an example, and I think similarly about coding, you teach writing, okay? And I know the way in which you prize the craft of writing, the fighting for every word, every phrase. You know, as Hemingway said, a good day is one in which you write one good sentence, okay? In that endeavor of becoming that master craftsman of writing, is there any role at all for a Mr. Chat GPT? My fear is zero. My opinion is that the art of clear writing taught by Amit Verma will not contain one session on how to use chat GPT and get your writing work done quick and dirty. It is not the journey to that mastery. And yeah, not most, a lot of people don't want that mastery. So I'm fine with the idea that you'll co- convert quartile two people armed with the tool to become more like quartile three people. And that's a great contribution. I don't want to knock that. I'm just pushing back against some of the claims around the word intelligence and some of the overblown thinking around the words LLM. LLMs are word prediction tools and that has their place. But you know, it will... I, I, but I uh, isn't there a conflation here? I think people who talk about AGI, for example, artificial general intelligence, they're not talking about LLMs. They're talking about a lot of the other stuff, which you are also fine. incredibly yeah. so excited about. As long as about. we are clear on that, I'm yeah. fine. So I, I'm just reporting my anxiety mm. on these two fronts. One is around the claims of AI and the other is my worry about the journey to mastery. That, In my opinion, either in programming or in writing, the journey to mastery does not contain these tools. So I would switch off GitHub Copilot and write code from scratch if I was 17. I also want to express another thought, which is sort of a clarification on what mastery should mean for people. Like when you said that if someone does my course, I will teach them to look at sentences carefully and not to use chat GPT to generate sentences of their own. And those who are motivated and who really care will do that anyway, right? But here's the thing. I think I am, I want to make a a distinction here 
between the thin desire that people have of their writing being successful in the market and getting validation for it and the thick desire of just the act of creation which is beautiful in and of itself and i think what's going to happen is that that thin desire of the validation and what happens in the marketplace is going to get a little irrelevant because 10 years 15 years i don't want to put a date to it because we overestimate the short term always as we underestimate the long term at some point in terms of output there will be great novels great music great operas constantly being produced by ai and you cannot compete with them i don't care about that i don't think that is a threat what will remain with you is the joy of creation the mastery for its own sake for the satisfaction it gives you and if you are focused on that i think you're fine but if you are going to if you are doing things for validation then i would argue that is the wrong reason anyway so the people who are worried about this are worried for the wrong reasons and they'll often be you know the same people who will say that hey i can never be that good is sort of complete on steroids and they will also say that you know hey what's going to happen to us we are the true artists appreciate us you know and and they're actually contradictory uh, views so just to close on this and move on to more fun things my opinion is that even 50 years from now what these tools will do is they will kill the mass produced formulaic stuff so your jerry pinto example that you have uh romance novels which are churned out by the 100 uh, no human will get paid a wage to churn those out it'll just be prompt engineering but no i don't think that the great works will come out of that that will remain a human preserve and it's it's a reshuffling of the labor market that there are roles and profiles where there is a lot of mass produced music there is mass produced screenplays there is mass produced research papers there is mass produced opinion pieces these will lose all value as constructed by humans it will be a winner takes all world with a vengeance where there'll be a few humans producing the true originality and the rest will all be manufactured by machines okay but now let's turn to more fun stuff but i'll simply say before you go there that i disagree that i think you earlier you said that ai is nothing but statistical models i'm saying beethoven's brain had nothing but statistical so models want, and that's enough to reach that level of creativity so there i want to disagree my einstein example that no statistical model standing in 1904 could have come up with special relativity it is sub completely new because all the corpus is everything you trained on was different so you could have never L- thought something new that's an llm argument not an ai argument correct so that's why i want to be narrow around llm yeah. so now let's talk about more fun stuff let's talk about ai i'm actually mo- so there's a lot else going on in the field uh the stuff that really gets me excited and makes me say wow is in a somewhat different space uh you and i are both great uh, enthusiasts about chess and we know what it felt like when we first found some of the games that alpha zero played alpha zero against some of the other engines alpha zero against itself okay there are, alpha zero for me was something new it thought of something new it gave us new ideas on strategy it made us think about openings in a new way it made us think about reward sacrifice and reward in a new way that you don't have to get scared and be greedy and in two three moves get back that pawn it's okay take 15 moves because you will have created a structural disability on one side and in time it's going to work so it is an amazing set of ideas you know magnus carlsen has changed his ideas about chess because of seeing uh alpha zero work for me that is fascinating that was exciting that was new it was not derivative it was not done by just looking at all the games of the past of course that was used as part of the journey but as you know for millions of games it played against itself and the beauty is chess is a finite game with a reward function and you are able to climb that hill and discover new wonders by climbing the hill and you're not just derivative so there's an objective black and white game and we have found better ways of climbing the hill and discovering new things that is cool that is remarkable and that is exciting and then we saw those approaches being applied in many other walks uh there was a famous example around protein folding where these kinds of algorithms comprehensively solved questions that had defied human science for a long time and then there are two recent examples that just had me squealing with excitement one was that there is a long standing problem of matrix multiplication the the best algorithms uh, which are called strassen multiplication had been done about 50 years ago and for 50 whole years no human had ever been able to figure out how to do it better and what the scientists were able to do was again to gamify it to represent the very algorithm used for multiplying matrices as a parameter vector and then optimize in a space 
where the parameter vector maps to the correctness of the matrix multiplication and the time taken to achieve the matrix multiply. And lo and behold, we're holding the first improvements in 50 years on how to do matrix multiplication. This is huge. These better algorithms are going back into computer systems all over the world. There is no operation in the world more basic than matrix multiplication. Or is there? There is the operation of sorting. What could be more basic than using a computer to sort numbers? And again, the folks at DeepMind represented a sorting code in LLVM as a parameter vector over which to optimize. And they gamified it saying, we will penalize you for making mistakes in the sorting and for taking time. And today we are holding better codes for sorting, which is again, huge. So this is so exciting that we're using machines to discover things that we humans had not found. And this is just the beginning. Like where could it go further? And so this stuff makes me really excited. This is wow material. And by the way, just parenthetically, there's something very sweet inside these things. So uh, for all of us readers of science fiction, there has always been this idea that we will make some machines and then the machines will help us to make better machines. And so the spiral keeps exploding all the way to the singularity. Well, here we are. The machines are helping us to make a better sort algorithm. The machines are helping us to make a better matrix multiplication. And this feeds back to stronger machines. And then that stronger machine will find an even better sort algorithm. So I just love these things. So a couple of things. One, as far as protein folding is concerned, if you've ever seen me wrap a bacon around, wrap a piece of bacon around a sausage, you'll realize I'm bloody good at protein folding. <laughs> Second, you mentioned that it, these innovations had you squealing with excitement. Yeah. Can you kindly demonstrate? <laughs> I'm serious. How do you squeal yeah. with excitement? That's just something like what Are you I said just now. now boss? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd love to see you squealing with excitement. Mm. Uh, quickly on Alpha Zero, because I was blown away by it. I'm a keen chess player. I had written a column on it, which will be uh, like a link down below. I mean, anything either of us have written on anything we've discussed will be linked down below. And uh, so for the benefit of my listeners, just to simplify what exactly happened, there were two sort of revolutions there, there were two seminal moments in chess as far as computers are concerned and i'm not even talking about the kasparov uh, a match of 97 i'm talking about a 2003 2004 when stockfish became easily more powerful than the most powerful human player and players started using computers for pedagogy and teaching themselves and instead of everything become homogenized because because of computers it actually went in the opposite direction because before this all the heuristics that people use basically from the soviet school of how you occupy the center, how you use space and initiative was a fixed set of rules. And now you could find concrete exceptions to those rules using Stockfish and therefore go off in different directions, which has led to incredibly creative players like Wesley Shiso and Ali Raza Firusha and so on, who are just so, think so differently, you know. Like Anand at one point uh, noted that, you know, with players of his generation, you, if they made an unexpected move, completely unexpected move, it was probably a bad move. But this generation, they're just thinking differently. That was one revolution. 2017 was the next revolution which changed everything. Now, Stockfish, the, if the strongest human player, Carlson, is about 28, 70 in classical chess, Stockfish would have been about 35, 3600. Alpha Zero came. It taught itself to play chess by playing with itself 24 for 24 hours, no human database, played with itself. In that time, if you look at the database of games, it followed the same progression as humans did. Whereas, you know, at one point in the 19th century, the French defense was fashionable. Today, we know it is suboptimal. At one point in 2001, when Kramnik Kasparov, we, uh, you know, Kramnik unleashed the Berlin defense and we realized how strong it is. You know, Alpha Zero discovered the Berlin defense. The same evolutionary path and then going further beyond where humans are and then doing things that we don't understand. And like you correctly pointed out, it realized that many of the heuristics of the past, for example, the relationship between material and uh, uh, initiative, what stood for compensation, changed completely. Now, obviously, you had people, you know, right from the 60s, you had Petrosian with, you know, making exchange sacrifices fashionable and so on, you know, long term strategic bond sacrifices were common. But the kind of sacrifices Alpha Zero did, or the kind of attacks it did along the flanks, along the A and H files, which, like you said, Carlson took up. All of these guys took up. And Carlson's coach, Peter Heine Nelson, once said that I always wondered 
that if aliens with a superior intelligence came to earth how would they play chess <laughs> and now i know when he saw the alpha zero yeah. games and the thing about the alpha zero games is we can figure out some of the things that it has learned for example the relationship between material and initiative and what it does down the flanks we don't know how it did them we don't know why it did them yeah. it is a black box over it's an there. alien intelligence it's an alien intelligence it is a black box we don't know how it does what it does and it keeps getting smarter and smarter yeah. which is incredibly exciting yeah. and i think that machine learning in such a way could come up with fundamental could do the einsteinian thing mm mm special relativity is special <laughs> <laughs> so you know I, there's an there's a normal science that I have stress in multiplication. I'll do it better. There is sorting. I'll do it better. The leaps, the four papers of Einstein, uh, I continue to think, are conceptual explosions that don't come to the machines. But that's okay. Once again, this stuff is revolutionary. This stuff is incredibly useful. It will partner with humans in doing research. the improvements in the matrix algorithms that were made by uh, deep mind then turn around and fuel mathematicians who try to understand what happened prove theorems about it so i don't see it as either or and i i don't see it as replacing humans but i i feel this stuff is revolutionary this stuff changes the course of production of human knowledge so a question for you which is again the fundamental question of how alarmist we should get around it i think there's a lot of alarmism about hey ai is going to wipe out the human race and it's a genuine smile because my thought is why are we placing the human species on a pedestal if it wipes us out or drive wipes us out but just for the sake of the listeners like the classic example of this is something called the paperclip maximizer right that's a thought experiment used for this that if you build an all powerful machine whose purpose is to maximize manufacturing paper clips and it goes haywire then it could start turning all organic matter into material for paper clips till the whole universe is paper clips and what do you do ai can go out of whack like that and uh you know we're going to link to a beautiful essay in the show notes by mark anderson about i think with the title of something like how ai is going to save us all and it's a beautiful essay he addresses all of these questions in great detail but a i i think if it were to happen hypothetically so effing what and b it is simply not going to happen you know no more than gps is going to destroy us we have incredibly so, so powerful tools that's going to make our lives better yeah. so i i find the claims that the ai will rule the world the machines will dominate i find them to be farcical that's not a fair description it's science fiction material there there are beautiful poems about this we will link to one but i find it farcical here's the way that it will proceed okay when humans built the automobile there were accidents and people died and you don't ascribe agency to the automobile you ascribe agency to the driver this stuff is going to repeat itself over and over the machine will do a diagnosis based on an x-ray it will make mistakes it will kill people it's going to happen with probability one this is the nature of the beast it wouldn't surprise me in the least there are going to be military robots which will autonomously make decisions to fire a trigger they will kill some civilians it's going to happen with probability one these are the kind of problems that will come about and they are old they're not new so all engineering involves finding a design that finds an ethical legal and safe trade off between type 1 and type 2 errors that you will either be very cautious and never come up with a false tb diagnosis or you will make a mistake and miss many tbs that's the trade off every algorithm has to assess the loss function the weight the cost to society or the legal liability for the producer of those two kinds of errors those errors are just baked and they're going to happen for sure and none of this bothers me too much so i don't have an alarmist sense about this it's good lots of things are going to happen and we're going to become more and more effective we have better machines that's all it's just it's a continuation of the machine age we we got new kinds of craft whereby new kinds of machines are being produced that's all no more and no less and this you know this is again a classic case of the seen and the unseen that what will be seen as a one error the life lost to that you don't see the life saved Correct. by the fact that the technology exists you use the word ethical so here's yeah. a question for you and here's a question that's you know been debated so profusely uh, and i don't really have an answer to that so i want to see what you think which is that you know the case 
humans again we put ourselves on a pedestal in an ethical sense we consider other humans worthy of moral consideration but not say animals not plants because at some level we are placing ourselves as superior to them and uh, there is a implication that consciousness and intelligence is a part of this we've reached up the food chain in that and some would of course argue we are colonized by bacteria we are colonized by wheat all of which are true so we should you know dial down the hubris but we've treated ourselves as special and for us the only being beings uh, unless you're um, an ethical vegetarian the only beings really for most of us um, um, uh, who deserve our moral consideration are other human beings and for many people not even all other human beings but a selected subset now when ai if you have agi which i believe is a matter of time uh, if once even if you think it isn't let's go with that thought experiment that if you have agi which is more intelligent than humans and which has an analog of consciousness whatever you call it but is similar to it then isn't it rational for that agi to turn around and say to us why should i be your slave i'm superior to you in every way i'm smarter in every way and i'm not going to die so then does uh, why, why not at least provide them equal ethical consideration and then if we say on what basis are we saying we are special that we are made of flesh and blood and we are going to die that really is the only reason at no, all once you're ready to sign on to the assumptions that we get to an agi it has consciousness then we are in a different game altogether i'm just not there i am on a mundane environment there are type 1 and type 2 errors the company is making a car where the brakes will either fail to save some pedestrians on the road or have some other adverse consequences how will you weigh these things profit maximization will lead the firms to do some things maybe there are ethical and societal preferences that have to weigh on this maybe there's a market failure you're killing too many people because your brakes don't work and then the liberal democratic system will try to find some rules that your brakes have to have minimum x quality that's all i'm thinking of very mundane things that what's the failure rate of the software system that looks at an x-ray and diagnoses tb what are the rules by which you will allow that to be the final arbiter and save money by not putting an expert so you know what you really want is a man machine hybrid where the machine will say look this one i'm absolutely sure is not tb this one i'm absolutely sure is tb in these middle roads here's what i roughly think but i'm really not sure now you need a human being you'll need a master okay so it's a sort of back to the llm type discussion that how much is a role for a master but the master is expensive so the firms will want to cut corners you'll get the usual market failure regulation type debate that do you need a government or industry norms or practices or clubs associations i, I want to be fully cosian you don't have to have government doing all the heavy lifting i just see these quiet mundane problems as long as you don't sign on to the platform that there is an agi it has consciousness then everything is different then you know then we're building for neumann machines we're colonizing the galaxy everything is different and as an aside i just want to go back to chess yeah. and you mentioned man machine hybrid and there was this period of time between kasparov playing deep blue and between stockfish becoming as strong as it is where the, uh, many people used to say with great confidence including ai experts that it is not man versus machine something that is stronger than both of them is a man machine hybrid is a man playing with a machine yeah. and today we look back on that and with hindsight we can say that it is ludicrous the people who said that got it completely wrong yeah. and i have a feeling that we are, we might be underestimating ai in so again a, chess a similar is a finite closed problem i am focusing on a whole bunch of statistical real world problems little more llm terrain a car is looking at a scene and there is imperfect information and you're doing inference under uncertainty so most of the world is just those statistics problems chess is a finite closed problem on on chess it's clear like you know matrix multiply is a finite problem so it's a different thing but if you have to look at a data set and engage in statistical inference around it there will always be type 1 and type 2 errors because there can never be a perfect algorithm <laughs> All right, so we've said a lot of uh, things we wanted to say about AI. Agree to disagree uh, genially, uh, as AI also would, because no emotions here. Eh? I mean, <laughs> so we now, are the messed up creatures. Now, do, let's get to the fun stuff. Give us some recommendations. So I want to recommend three books. Uh, the first of them is a classic of feminism, and and a book I hold very close to my heart is by Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, a, a vindication of the rights of women. Now, the way I think about the world. 
to a large extent comes from John Locke and his thinking on natural rights, starting with the right to self-ownership and so on and so forth about how all rights emanate from there. And even if you don't agree with natural rights, that's a good way to think about how you construct rights, you know, and you can get negative and positive rights out of that. And I won't elaborate on that this time. That's a separate issue. Wallstonecraft read Locke. Right. And she had one fundamental question to ask. And she is living in the late 1800s. Uh, incredibly strong woman, incredibly smart woman. I would even say a great modern philosopher. Uh, married to an interesting guy, also a bit of an asshole, but leave him out, um, out of the equation. And so she wrote a book called The Vindication on the Rights of Women, which asks a fundamental question that Locke is absolutely right. Why should it apply only to men? Right. Because that is almost a default assumption of the age. That is, you know, you, the, your default pronoun is always he. You're always talking about man, men, everything It's mankind, not humankind. So Wallstonecraft's book is uh, then a brilliant book length argument to that effect, which is as much a work of philosophy as a work of polemic. It's incredibly powerful and it's incredibly tragic. Because she actually died after childbirth because at that time, doctors did not know how to wash their, uh, that they had to wash their hands. So she got an infection, she died after childbirth. And if you remember back in the last episode, we spoke about uh, the aggressively conventional minded. Around half a century later, when Ignaz Semmelweis did his studies and proved that hand washing led to infections and death. For about 20 years, Semmelweis was ignored, he was hounded, he was cancelled because he did not conform to the conventional thinking and he died in a mental asylum. Right, which is one of the great tragic stories of our times. But anyway, that was 50 years after Wallstonecraft. She dies in childbirth and the daughter she gives birth to is Mary Shelley. I mean, she later marries Percy Shelley and becomes Mary Shelley. Right. Otherwise, Mary Wallstonecraft the second. And I don't know. It's not recorded to what extent she was haunted by her mother's death. And she was a bit of a feminist, but didn't do much writing in that regard. But she went on to write what would be the second book on my list, which is Frankenstein, where she created a monster. And in a sense, the metaphor that that monster has become also speaks to many of the modern fears around AI itself, which we were discussing. So it's a remarkable book for that reason. And to me, it's like proto science fiction. People call it the first science fiction book ever. There was books earlier. There were books later. It's a pioneering book. I'd call it proto science fiction. If you look at it with a modern lens, a lot of things wrong with the craft and so on. You can critique it. But I think she was in her early 20s when she wrote it. And it was a pioneering book. There was nothing like that before. If you look at, if you imagine her LLM, there is nothing like that. She's just creating this new genre, sui generi. And it's such a great book. So just sort of to read the mother's book published, you know, uh, a couple of decades before this and then to read this book and see the arc of the stories is fascinating and my third recommendation therefore is a book that tells that stories uh, that story it's a book by charlotte gordon called romantic outlaws okay. and it's about that period you read about wallstonecraft her marriage the women of a period the lives they lived you read about mary shelley you even read about the romantic poets shelley byron keats and all of that who in my view should not even be taught in school today like they are because they take away young people's passion for poetry yeah. they're not even good poets we romanticize her yeah. we should be teaching mary oliver and mark strand instead but you know uh those three are my recommendations wonderful book wonderful arcs i did i used to do this audio uh book audio podcast for storytell where i would speak about a book for about 15 minutes and i spoke about both washington crafts i have episodes on both washington crafts book and shelley's book so i'll link that from the show notes but uh, these are beautiful books and more than that it's these are beautiful and inspiring lives someone who can ask that question why not women also you know when she reads Locke, and then someone who can without any precedent existing say let me write a novel about a monster you know and it's it's remarkable for that reason yep all right so what about your recommendation i want to recommend a better masala chai Explain. <laughs> um, this may be well known to some people in South India, but for most people north of Karnataka or maybe north of the Vindhyas, this may be new. Okay, so I want to tell the story. One day I was in Chennai and I was walking around on the street and I suddenly saw a man with a cart selling something I'd never seen before. It was some kind of route. So... I went up there with curiosity and I asked in English, what is this? Okay. And there was another customer standing next to me who immediately rattled off 
the scientific name of that plant, Hemi something indicus. So I said, huh? And so I immediately bought some and I wrote down the scientific name of that plant and I came back and started studying it. And in Tamil, it's called Nannari. And it's it's a very, very interesting smell, hints of cardamom, hints of camphor. And it is used to make a syrup in Tamil Nadu, which is called Nannari syrup, oftentimes with way too much sugar. And it's used to make a drink in Tamil Nadu. And it was nice and interesting and it stopped there. So that was my first introduction to Nannari. Then many years later, I was hiking up in the Sahyadris. I was near a place called Jivdan. This was now a couple of years ago. Uh, and there was a village and there was a woman there who was going to make a chai for us. And I said, make a chai with uh, ginger, with ala. And she said, I don't have ginger. But shall I do something else? She said, I said, yeah, figure it out. And she brought back an amazing masala tea that I had never tasted before. It was interesting. It was wonderful. And I was just so surprised. So I love masala chai. I'm always experimenting with recipes for masala chai. And this was new. In my entire life, I'd never had this. And it was nice. It was interesting. So then I said, what did you do? So she and her husband uh, said the name of the root in Marathi for me. And I had never heard this before. And I wanted to be absolutely sure I never lost it. So I made a voice recording of them saying the name of this plant because I wanted to be sure I'll track this down. Gauti Kauli, Gauti Chaha. Okay. Then I asked the man, where do you get it? He says, it's just here. It's all around. It's on the hillside. So I said, can you take me and find me a sapling? So he said, sure. So we walked around the hill and he found a plant and he dug it out and he gave it to me saying, here, take this sapling, take some home for the wife. And uh, then I brought that sapling back and then I also discovered that it actually, I found it in some other locations in Maharashtra, but still no name. And I started speaking with the people I knew who know Marathi. I played back that audio clip. What is this? And they said, we've never heard of this before. So it was some local name that was being used up in the mountains and nobody else knew it. Then one fine day, I was smelling that root and thinking and thinking. And I had that aha moment that this smell reminds me of Nannari, the Tamilian root that I had purchased in Chennai. And so then I triangulated and put all the pieces together. And the answer is yes, that it was the same root. So in short, my recommendation is buy Nannari root and grind it into a powder and put it into your tea. And then I discovered that this is a kind of tea that is made, uh, it's a Tamil Muslim recipe and I found that recipe on the internet. So it's a novel take on masala chai that if you have loved masala chai all your life and if you've never had the amazing unique flavor of Nanari or Amrutmul as it's called in Maharashtra or it has many names all over India, then I recommend that you try this. So I have a follow-up question for you that I don't like masala tea. I don't like tea. However, about 30 times you have made what you call herbal tea for me. Each time it's been different. Each time it's been wonderful. Sometimes it's been just more than that. And uh, as Susan, your wife says that it's actually not tea because there's no tea in it. Basically, you go out, you collect a whole bunch of herbs and you put them uh, in the tea and you figure out different ways to make it interesting. But I want to ask about the philosophy behind that because you've spoken about how important it is to have a tremendous amount of biodiversity in whatever you eat or drink or whatever because that helps your immune system and it's really important for our health. Just elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, it's much more than just the immune system. The logic is something like this. Uh, modern man is 100,000 years old from minus 100,000 to minus 5,000. It was in hunter-gatherer conditions. We know in modern analysis of hunter-gatherer peoples that they eat hundreds of species. So they know the forest very well and they are uh, using a vast number of different species. Now, that's important because modern science has only begun to scratch the surface on all the micronutrients that come together. So uh, around in, in the 20th century, we started discovering vitamins. Now, these are just molecules that are used in very small quantities that matter disproportionately, that if you didn't get 
vitamin C on a long sea voyage, you would get the horrible disease called scurvy. And it is very sim- solved in a very easy way by just carrying pickled limes, okay, things like that. So we started getting one story after another. But our knowledge is very weak and we only dimly understand the complexities of the human body and of all the things that come together. So I feel one important element of wellness is the biodiversity of what we are ingesting, that there is valuable knowledge amongst traditional peoples. And I would also emphasize just diversity, that the sheer number of different species that you're taking in is a way of respecting our lack of knowledge about the way the human body works. That's a wonderful note to end the episode on. And uh, listeners would note that We've introduced diversity in this episode. The last episode had just the two of us. We've had a third host in this episode in the form of the wonderful Mark, who is, I think, now asleep on top of a bookshelf over there and has kind of been cavorting around in the background. I have been led to believe by our producers who basically said to us in the break that we haven't heard a word you guys said because you're old and boring anyway, but Mark was in the background. Uh, Mark has more AGI than any LLM. I don't even know what you mean by that, but... You know, so hey, thank you for being there. We'll be back for episode three. Do give us feedback on what you would like us to talk about, what we can do differently. We are new to video. We are learning the craft. We appreciate all the help we can get. Thank you. Oh, okay. So uh, my resting pout face is too much. It's sulky. Oh, okay, cool. I'll remember to smile. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, while you saw the title on the screen, my producer just said that, hey, you're having too much of the resting pout face, so you got to smile. So I'm going to give a jokerish permanent smile on my face right now. So thank you. Maybe a joker mask will work. Maybe a joker mask will work. Yeah.